Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Data Race Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimize your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. We're excited today to have Andreas Freund. Uh, he's a core committer on the Presswiss team uh, based out of Microsoft. Um, Andreas is here to talk about Postgres, obviously, but he's very, very explicit in saying in his bio that he is not a DBA. So he's not here to answer DBA questions. It's more about Postgres internal questions. So if you have any questions for Andreas as you give him the talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and feel free to do this anytime. We want this to be a conversation. Um, and with that, Andreas, the floor is yours. Go for it. Cool. I today want to talk about uh, how IO and Postgres works. Uh, why it works like that, uh, what the problems are, and why we want to change it, and what made us change it right now rather than uh, having done so in the past. I started working on Postgres uh, about 15 years ago first, uh, and then increased it over time to do more and more uh, of my time. Um, to get started with, uh, Postgres has a fairly simple design in the end, and the basics are have been the same for at least uh, 15 to 20 years. Uh, there's a buffer pool uh, in a shared memory. That buffer pool, uh, all the re like data accesses go through the buffer pool. Uh, and the buffer pool is filled by not, not buffered IO uh, using pread, pwrite, or uh, whatever the system calls are for the platform. And when I say buffered IO, the relevant thing for that, for those of you that don't know, is that uh, we, the application, in this case Postgres, will do a system call, but then it will not directly do IO to the drive. It will go, first go to the kernel page cache. The page cache in the kernel might already have the data. But if, if not, then the page cache will go and ask a drive, say, give me the data. Then the drive will uh, return the data, often via DMA. And DMA just means that the copying of the data doesn't have to be done by the CPU. Uh, and then at the end uh, of uh, the IO, the kernel gets notified that the IO has been completed, and the data for, is copied from the kernel uh, page cache into the application. Uh, and then the syscall completes. As a contrast to that, there's also direct IO. And uh, here, the kernel page cache is not included. Uh, so the application will do a system call, and that will go to a, will be converted into a IO uh, by the kernel. Uh, and uh, then the drive uh, or whatever hardware can do directly memory do memory access into the buffer provided by the application and do that again via DMA. So there's no manual copying of data that's required. Uh, for uh, durability, Postgres uses a fairly standard write ahead log approach. So whenever data from the buffer pool has to be written out, it has to first lock the, uh, synchronize the log to disk before writing it out the data if it has been modified uh, long enough ago, or recently enough that uh, the corresponding write ahead log is not yet uh, written out. Since uh, we've over time improved the design here, like we have group commit, we have, uh, the wall in memory is, uh, can be written to it concurrently by multiple processes because that was often a significant uh, bottleneck and similar other improvements. Checkpoints aren't uh, done synchronously by user applications or anything like that. Uh, they happen in the background and there's a dedicated process doing so. And uh, that works reasonably well like, and typically there's continuously going ongoing checkpoints. There's also there's more further helper processes. Uh, one is the wall writer, which write, unsurprisingly writes out the wall uh, while uh, when applications don't need to do so. Uh, there's a background writer and uh, do you have a dedicated slide for this? Uh, uh, that will write out uh, data buffers uh, before backends have to be, when they do need to do buffer replacement. And the buffer replacement uses a very simplistic buffer replacement algorithm. It's a it's not kind of not really clock, but it's based it was originally based on the clock paper, uh, which basically uh, has a the primary goal is that it's very concurrent, 
one doesn't need to uh, maintain expensive linked lists or something of uh, all buffers. Instead, each buffer just has a number of times it has been used since the last time the state was, the usage count was reset. And each backend goes through the clock of all buffers and checks whether a usage count is zero and uses that buffer or uh, uh, decreases the usage count and goes on. Uh, the background writer basically integrates into that and tries to write out buffers before uh, backends have to, because obviously, when queries or something have to write out data, that's time they spend that we normally don't want uh, to spend in user oriented, uh, like in user queries. How about the um, result, how, how do you maintain, because it's clock, you, you can get, you know, switch scan flooding. How does Postgres ensure that, like, you know, Postgres doesn't, doesn't blow out the whole cache? Uh, there's a pretty Mediocre uh, defense against that, which is that Postgres has uh, ring buffers, what they call, uh, that are used for uh, operations that do bulk IO, like sequential scans, vacuum, and so on. And those ring buffers uh, are of a fixed size. And whenever uh, pages, uh, new pages to be read, and it's not already in uh, shared buffers, uh, then we use a page like from that ring buffer and uh, write the old contents or discard the old contents from the ring buffer, which then means that uh, sequential scans, for example, I think uh, by default have 128 kilobyte size ring buffers. So they will not read in more new data than fits into that ring buffer. Most of you might have uh, seen the problem with that approach, which is that if you start with a cold cache, uh, sequential scans, will not uh, fill uh, shared buffers very quickly because they will use that ring buffer. Now that's a bit, um, not quite as bad as it sounds because it only happens for the whole ring buffer design for sequential scans is only used for relations uh, above uh, a quarter of shared buffers, which is like a pretty crude heuristic, but uh, it definitely is a problem that in production workloads sometimes you can, like in more analytically oriented uh, cases, you can end up with the data never being loaded to shared buffers eff effectively, even though the whole workload actually fits into shared buffers. For example, if there's one large relation. One can do that manually using like an extension to read in the data or something like that, but it's definitely a practical problem. That ring buffer, that's controlled by work memory on, on a per worker basis? No, that's just a compile time constant, a set of compile okay. time constants. And like okay. copy uses a larger one, uh, vacuum uses a pre like something of that of in the dozens of kilobytes or something. Rage copy uses a very comparatively large one, like up to sixteen megabytes, I think. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, the checkpointer also does a few other tasks, um, like. Uh, Right, uh, syncing files, uh, which as part of the checkpoint, it, all the data files need to be synced. And uh, it does like sync some auxiliary data, does some other uh, related tasks, uh, but it's not particularly interesting. Um, one thing that we had to do uh, to make the buffered IO not uh, completely terrible uh, was that uh, to add control over dirty data in the kernel. Um, when, for example, a checkpoint uh, writes out a lot, the checkpoint on a large database will write out a lot of dirty data. And so the, uh, the kernel page cache can fill up with lots of dirty data. And when the kernel then suddenly decides all that dirty data needs to be written out, uh, latency can completely crater. Like on, I think in around 2014, there were a lot of cases where uh, the kernel would start to write out data so aggressively that every other IO was delayed by hundreds of seconds. We saw delays where not a single IO was happening for 300 seconds. Uh, obviously, there were some uh, issues in Linux, but it's also just a huge problem if uh, Postgres writes out 100 gigabytes of dirty data into the kernel page cache on a large system, and the kernel has not an act, a real throttle on how much data can be uh, dirtied, then and the eventual f-sync or just when the kernel decides in the background to write it out, obviously that can take a long time if your uh, storage is not very, very fast. So these days we use, uh, 
so, uh, use sync file range and msync and other s similar uh, approaches to control, to limit how much dirty data the kernel is allowed to have. And that can be set on a per back, like for different tasks, like Checkpointer has its own limit, uh, backends have their own limit, uh, background writer has their own limit and so on. That uh, And that has uh, improved latency, especially worst case latency, drastically. Uh, so given how simplistic this approach is, why <laughs> didn't Postgres basically fail? And I think that's a good answer because like we've been told uh, that using Buffer.io will basically not work at all and it will, it's terrible, terrible, terrible. And there's definitely uh, some truth to it, but it also turns out that for our use case where Postgres is most used, it's actually not always terrible. For one, like Linux does a decent job uh, doing uh, read ahead internally. Um, it has, the page cache is pretty decent for, compared to some other operating systems. Uh, because I've mentioned earlier that our buffer replacement algorithm isn't great, and the kernel actually uh, saves the day often there because if Postgres buffer replacement algorithm fails, the kernel might still uh, save the, uh, like have the data. Obviously. Uh, using our own buffer pool and the kernel buffer pool has significant issues as well. Like the double buffering that can happen between both is, uh, can waste a lot of many memory. You said a Linux, a Linux like page cache replacement policy is the best, like seems to be the best. Which one is the worst for all the different platforms that OS Windows. Is? Windows? Windows, by far. Okay. Oh, we know there's some, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Like it's, I think part of it is that uh, there's a lot of metadata slownesses uh, that happen even when uh, accessing the page cache. Uh, then the control over what is like, it is not very aggressive about keeping stuff cached, especially in older versions. Uh, but to be honest, I've my Windows experience is limited and very very dated, despite my employer. So. Um, um, I I didn't want to bring it up, but they are paying they are paying you. But okay, I thought you could say like H box it like throw someone like nobody, I know us nobody cares about under the bus. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Blazer, I don't think keep so. Going. Keep going. Uh, and another reason that it was actually kind of okay was uh, that the most of the systems that Postgres ran ran on, especially back in the day, but also still now, uh, like. The storage isn't that fast and uh, not that concurrent. So limiting the limited uh, or the simplicity of the error stack often didn't uh, turn out to be a huge problem. And that uh, we do use prefetching, we have parallelism, and that hides a lot of the slow, like uh, some of the cost of that, the simplistic approach. Uh, As a related question, uh, you might ask, why uh, are we still, what are we doing? It? And like the main reason for that is that Postgres is a very, very small team compared to other database vendors. Um, if you look at the big commercial databases, there's teams of hundreds to thousands of people that are working on the core engine. Uh, Postgres, uh, when I started, where had maybe had I think one full-time person working on it or like close to full-time and uh, a bunch of people doing it uh, part-time. And it has increased obviously now, like we are definitely more than 10 people working on it full-time, but still like it's nothing compared to a lot of the other database engines. And even some Postgres forks have more people working on them than the core Postgres uh, team. Not all of them, but yeah. Uh, another reason is that it's actually not easy to change. Uh, there's been a lot of patches and proposals like, let's just use Dark O or let's just use uh, whatever. And it's not actually likely to be beneficial. Uh, and part of that is that when Postgres uses a process uh, model, and like this has been known to be a weakness since like the early, like basically before Postgres was Postgres QL. And uh, it was, oh, we have, it's a short term hack to work around the portability limitations in 1990. And unfortunately, 
as it happens, uh, such design decisions like creep into more and more places over time and aren't easy to change. Uh, there's plenty of other reasons uh, for why, the, why it's hard to change. Another thing is that it's not actually very, like just using direct IO is not uh, a solution. Uh, remember what I said earlier that when using direct IO, uh, the kernel doesn't do any caching. So if the client application is very simplistic, um, it that basically means that one IO will happen at a time. So uh, we'll, Postgres will submit an IO, or if Postgres were using direct IO, um, Postgres will submit an IO, the kernel will ask the disk, then it will copy, uh, then the data will return to Postgres, and so on. And which means that if Postgres does five IOs, it will take five times the maximum latency. And that's not really uh, acceptable. So direct IO, where the kernel doesn't do any caching and not do, doesn't do any read ahead and so on, is only viable if uh, when using asynchronous IO at the same time, because then Postgres can say, we won't submit uh, the IOs one by one, wait for the next one. Instead, we can submit a bunch of IOs at once. The disk can process them at the same time, and we can uh, get the results in parallel. Obviously, that only helps if the storage has the capacity to do process multiple IOs at the same time. But uh, that's been the case for quite a while on enterprise storage and for a decent amount of time. Uh, for even for normal consumer hardware. Another big problem is that uh, the AO uh, APIs are very, very platform dependent. There's basically no API that uh, works on more than one platform. There's POSIX AO, which is was supposed to be portable, but it's so incredibly bad that it's practically uh, unused on uh, in my experience and like for example the linux implementation is not actually using proper io it is implemented using a thread pool and it's full of data uh, loss style bugs so it's basically just something implemented somebody hacked together uh, to get some posix uh, compatibility uh, thing so and it's even just using a simplistic AO api is not going to enough one needs to do a lot of work to make it better uh, another reason is that just the way Postgres is used, it turns out to often uh, be okay to use buffered IO. And one of the main reason for that is that when, post when uh, running on shared hardware or when running on a system that isn't maintained by a DBA that has, or like a team of developers that has a lot of knowledge about how their data accesses look like, uh, they won't tune Postgres to have a large enough shared buffer. State the machine will often not be dedicated, so you can't even set a shared buffers large enough because there's other uh, tasks running on the same instance. And in those cases, the kernel managing and uh, deciding which application at the moment can have uh, da its data cached is very beneficial. And uh, so buffered IO is uh, something that is basically required for those use cases, not in general. And uh, traditionally, uh, one cannot use direct AO with, without, uh, uh, cannot use AIO without uh, direct AO. And uh, that's still the case for nearly all platforms. I'll get back to that uh, in a second. Another uh, thing is that at least some people in the Postgres community have fallen to is that sometimes only uh, make pragmatic decisions not to implement something, they become over time like this hallowed uh, truth that it's every all that stuff that the big vendors do is just wasted effort or something. And like I think buffered IO is one of the cases where we have like elevated uh, our, uh, our pragmatism to uh, the truth. Now, if it's actually kind of working okay, uh, why would you want to change that? And the main reason that is that the hardware landscape has changed. And there's also other things like Postgres has just grown bigger and there's, the adoption has grown, so we have more resources to do. But the main thing is that hardware has changed. And I'll just limit my the set, set things I'm going to talk about uh, here just for time reasons. But uh, one big trend is that we now have uh, 
storage that is just behaves very different than traditional storage. And I'm talking about NVMe, which is a storage protocol a specification for how storage can be accessed. And it's typically used for uh, SSDs, initially only for the very high end server ones, but now it's like if you buy a laptop, it will have an NVMe SSD. And NVMe here is really just a placeholder for a very kind of modern storage technology. This storage that doesn't use uh, NVMe to access it, but it's by far the widely most widely used uh, these days. And it, it, uh, NVMe accesses typically uh, storage via PCIe, uh, but there's also uh, abstractions where it can be used over network, over fiber channel, and uh, many other things. And one of the things that is very different than to do, uh, a lot of traditional storage protocols is that it allows multiple queues. It uh, One can put multiple IOs into those queues and can submit them at the same time with just a single uh, uncached write, like single hardware MMIO access. And that compares uh, very, is a very large difference to some of the traditional uh, protocols where every single IO requires multiple uh, uncached uh, accesses. And an uncached access, memory access is like on the orders of thousands of a few thousand cycles. So it's really, not cheap. If one needs to do that for every I.O. a couple of times, then that's really a problem. Particularly, or it didn't used to be a big problem because storage was so slow, but these days storage is fast enough that that's a real uh, problem. And with NVMe, the dispatch overhead is so small that uh, the, even the indirection to the, the kernel page cache uh, uh, is a significant issue. If I do have a single process doing I.O., uh, it's often faster to do direct IO or like uh, do it direct IO than use the kernel page cache, <laughs> as insane as it might sound, because the kernel page cache overhead it adds more latency than the storage itself. For that, one needs to have a high end storage, uh, but it's the overhead is very significant. The intra pro like switching between if many uh, designs for using a, uh, doing uh, IO in databases use worker threads to do all the IO or similar things. And with modern storage, that actually is a problem. Uh, the dispatch, like having to switch to a different thread to then submit an IO, that alone will often be like a fifth or something of a high-end drive of the latency a single IO has on a high-end drive. So that's really expensive. And that has gotten a lot worse with uh, the changes that have, that have been made in response to the specters and uh, other uh, type of uh, related hardware uh, processor attacks. The improvements uh, for uh, dispatch and for latency in general have been orders of magnitude over old hardware, whereas like the memory latency and so on has actually improved very little uh, in, over the last 20 years. It's not been it's been basically now like 1.5 2x faster. The bandwidth is much better. Uh, but the latency hasn't improved a lot. Uh, there should have been a separate. At some point, this was the, the, the bottom here were was two paragraphs. I don't know what I misedited there. Um, the latency for a single I/O on uh, NVMe can go, go down to uh, four millis uh, microseconds. And uh, that's for high-end uh, storage, like Intel, op like Optane with a tuned kernel and whatever. But that's not a lot of time. And so the every like adding other sources of latency is a significant problem. Another thing is that compared to older storage protocols, the bandwidth has just increased drastically. Uh, if uh, like using SATA or like the one of some SAS uh, of the same time, like bandwidth per drive was limited to at the top end for to 500 megabytes a second. These days, we're uh, a lot of uh, SSDs are limited solely by the PCIe bandwidth uh, they can use. So, and they use PCIe 4x. So, if uh, attached to a system with PCA3, that's three about three gigabytes a second. On PCA4, it's about seven gigabytes a second. Uh, so if using the kernel page cache, the bandwidth for copying that data from the kernel page cache back into the application memory is a significant problem. Uh, on server hardware, 
it's a bigger problem than on laptop hardware, as it turns out. Uh, often, the memory bandwidth one can do get uh, with a single process is on the order of eight to nine gigabytes a second. So a single process cannot copy that data, uh, like or can just about copy all the data from the kernel and cannot do anything else. It's also that at those speeds, the kernel, uh, like at least Linux, and or actually basically all operating systems that I've looked at, the page cache just doesn't scale to those speeds if uh, one has more than a bit of memory. The amount of memory allocations, all that is just uh, required is just too high. NVMe also can do a lot of I.O. concurrently. Modern storage can do a lot of I.O., but it was hard to expose before NVMe. Um, SSDs have basically are basically very extremely parallel. Typically, they have a lot of different uh, flash chips that can be used independently, and uh, so they can all process I.O. at the same time. And that can be exposed via NVMe, and that couldn't really be exposed uh, before. Now there's uh, each NVMe drive can expose multiple queues to an operating system that then can be filled parallel in parallel by different uh, without a lot of contention and that's just a very this orders of magnitude of diff performance different characteristic differences to previous technologies are very substantial. Uh, the other trend is, oh, even though it's not quite real hardware, is uh, that cloud network storage uh, behaves very different than a lot of traditional storage. It has actually reasonably high latency uh, compared to local storage um, on the, the better types of uh, storage that are typically much more expensive, have somewhere on the order of 0 0.3 milliseconds for uh, latency. Uh, there's some that that are a bit better, and the, the number like 0 0.3 is like from sometime mid last year, I think. Uh, the cheaper, but not the cheapest uh, storage has typically somewhere between one to four milliseconds latency and the difference between cloud vendors and generations of storage inside those cloud vendors. But what diff and the four milliseconds uh, is still better than like a spinning disk, but it's like a spinning disk had like enough, uh, 10 to 16 milliseconds in consumer hardware down to four on enterprise hardware. Uh, so it's on the same, it's close enough. But the big difference is that uh, typically uh, they have a lot of uh, concurrency and that's something that old storage didn't have. Um, even though the, like we, the better ones you can submit or if you if you have the necessary uh, size to get in, like to be allowed to submit that much I/O, one can do dozens to hundreds of I/Os in, in at the same time, and that's definitely not that wasn't the case for um, storage before, in, like when everything was based on disk with a few memory caches in front. And one needs to have a lot of I/O in flight at the same time to even be able to hit uh, like the band like. To, have to get decent band, uh, throughput, because otherwise the latency will just mean that one cannot utilize the storage at all. And currently, the raw write latency in Postgres on cloud storage is often a major issue, because uh, the way we do I/O it ends up with uh, needing to hit, like, have occurring the overhead of uh, storage latency uh, multiple times, and we have only one often like a group commit, but we have only a, one flush to the wall uh, going on at the same time. And like these changes like are large enough that we have to change something uh, in Postgres. So I've been working on moving Postgres or make t prototyping and then working further on using AO in Postgres uh, starting in 2019 sometime. And partially that was motivated that because at that time, uh, Linux uh, got a new uh, AO interface, uh, IO Uring. And for one, it has some nice efficiency properties in general, but the main reason why it was suddenly becoming more interesting for me in the context of Postgres is that IO Uring is the first uh, interface that supports doing buffered I/O uh, asynchronously. Uh, 
And as I mentioned earlier, for a lot of use cases of Postgres, there will not be somebody that can tune Postgres well enough uh, to have a properly sized chair buffers and the uh, uh, memory requirements that incurs are just not uh, suitable for some, even if you made it automatically tuned. Uh, uh, since uh, I started working on, like I have two colleagues have joined uh, working on it, uh, most, uh, Tom Thomas Manro helped me a lot with adding a lot of portability, and Melanie did a bunch of general work, and then helped a lot with prefetch, uh, like improving the prefetching. But more on that later. There's a few uh, design constraints around Postgres using AO in Postgres. One is the process model. Uh, a lot of the AO APIs don't aren't easily usable with multiple processes, without incurring some problems, um, and we could obviously work towards uh, using threads in Postgres. And I personally, and I'm not alone in this, think that's something we should do at some point. But it's a huge project on its own. Um, one other big and somewhat related issue is that if in a naive design, it's quite possible to have uh, deadlocks because one process starts in uh, asynchronous IO and then ends up being blocked on a lock. And the holder of that lock also uh, is waiting for that IO start by the first process to complete. And at that point, nothing can continue. So for that, uh, it needs to be possible that, uh, every, that uh, the process other than the issuer of IO can uh, complete IO, because then th they can avoid the deadlock by just saying, OK, I'm, waiting, I'm processing the completion of the IO. Um, we also want to have a design that does not require inter process context switches uh, for IO. Um, that's not possible on pl all platforms because they just don't have the necessary API for it. Um, but on the design should be so that we don't incur those. Um, intra process switches are even more expensive than inter uh, thread uh, context switches because. Um, a, the memory mapping changes between the uh, different processes so that the TLB and so on uh, needs to be uh, changed, or at least uh, there's contention about uh, TLB contents. Yeah, and maybe we're jumping ahead, but like, does this mean that like, within a worker, the worker now will be moving also threaded? No, uh, there's, I didn't do any, we didn't do any threading because that's just such a huge project on its own. So we, we, but, uh, yeah, keep, keep, keep going, keep going. Uh, another thing is that we need to deal with the portability issues uh, of uh, AO. Um, because still to this day, all the plat uh, APIs that are usable are basically platform dependent. Uh, and we, if there's going to be dozens of users of AO inside Postgres, we can't have oper uh, operating, operating system specific things creep into all those places. So we need to have an abstraction uh, for that. Uh, and we don't want uh, all the complexity of AOs uh, creeping into all the different places in Postgres to AO. We don't want to have a lot of knowledge of how exactly to schedule AO in vacuum, in sequential scans, in bitmap index scans, and all that stuff. Because then it'll just become unmaintainable for a team of our size. Uh, out of that basically flow, flows like some the minimal design that uh, I'm ca I can't go into detail in like in this time, but uh, the basics are that IO completions can be processed in any uh, process, and uh, that avoids the deadlock issue that I uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, AO itself doesn't uh, the AO module itself doesn't know anything about shared buffers. Uh, or something, because there's different types of IO there. We need, might need to do IO for wall, with the, which doesn't go through shared buffers. There's data that is not in shared buffers that we still might want to use AO and so on. Um, the IO layer can do uh, some optimization of IO before it's submitted to the hardware or to the operating system. And we, for example, if multiple IOs for different buff shared buffers are submitted, we do can combine them into one IO using scatter gather IO. 
uh, and uh, some other similar imp uh, improvements. And obviously that will depend on the specific hardware capabilities. Uh, we had to do a lot of um, improvements just to the general Postgres code. Some of them have already been committed. Some of them are still basically queued up as large part of the AO patch set. And the basic way that uh, most code interacts with uh, AO is that there is a streaming read interface where the users of AO provide a callback that says, give me the next uh, IO that needs to be done. For example, read this block at this offset. And um, then like the, the AO infrastructure know, can call that whenever it knows that need more IOs needs to be sub, need to be submitted, depending on the speed of the hardware of the size of shared buffers, whatever. Uh, and that turns out to work pretty well for um, converting most AO reads, because then shared buffers, uh, sequential scans can just read the different buffers that are not in shared buffers. Uh, uh, an abitment index scan can just read the buffers that are necessary, even though they're completely randomly distributed uh, across a file and so on. Right now, we have uh, four different backends uh, for AO in Postgres or in the patch set of Postgres. One is IO Ring, and that's what I was started with. That was uh, what motivated me to look again at uh, adding IO to Postgres. And one of the nice things is that uh, submitting IO does not, or even seeing, like getting completions for, uh, for, uh, uh, for IOs doesn't require any intra process context switches. And with, in some use cases, one can even just optimize even the syscalls away because the kernel can pull the uh, queue of to be submitted IOs and do it uh, submit, uh, like, to submit them without needing a system call. That's probably not going to be a major use case for Postgres um, because the CPU requirements for it are fairly high. Typically, that means that there has to be a kernel thread that is running at like 100% CPU usage. And that's probably too costly uh, for most users of Postgres, but who knows. And the other nice thing about IO is that it supports IO with uh, when using buffered IO. For buffered reads uh, these days, it doesn't uh, have a it doesn't need a kernel thread for writes. It currently still uses a kernel thread to do the IO asynchronously, but that's is work, ongoing work to also not uh, use uh, like a dedicated thread or something to do IO. Uh, one very the other very important uh, way of doing IO is not actually doing IO. It's using uh, worker processes that uh, do IO, and the reason those are so that's so crucial is that without that we couldn't uh, require use of AO uh, in all the code of Postgres because not all platforms will have uh, decent AO, AO support. And even if they do have it, we might not actually have the code for some platforms. And po uh, traditionally, portability has been something valued very highly in Postgres. There's also POSIX AO, and that's mostly there because of macOS and FreeBSD. Uh, but there's it, the API has real problems, so it's there's a lot of ugly code associated with it. It's by, I think at the moment the biggest backend. Uh, we also have a, a work in progress IOCP backend for Windows. Uh, there's some more work to be done, mostly because not, uh, none of us are expert Windows developers. So a lot of it has been developed by, remotely by SCI, and <laughs> that has some uh, development cycle latency. Uh, we've converted quite a few subsystems uh, to use uh, AO uh, at this point. Uh, we've uh, The most important one actually was committed to Postgres itself recently, and it just uses uh, POSIX F advice and so on. Um, when uh, in the as committed, and then with a patch, uh, with the AO patch that will actually use AO. And the reason why a read ahead during wall replay is so important is that uh, before that, I often had the like the generation of wall was so fast due to using asynchronous AO that uh, but recovery would. 
uh, read the wall and then read all the buffers referenced by the wall. And because it was using direct air, it would be extremely slow. I've had a lot of cases where I, within five minutes, generated so much wall that replaying it with direct air it literally took hours. And that makes uh, de the development cycle very painful because, as one might imagine, um, it's pretty common to have crashes <laughs> when developing a completely new uh, code. The checkpointer uh, does a lot of, uh, does use AO, and that's a very easy conversion, the background writer. Similarly, one of the harder conversions was that uh, wall writes are now done using AO, and there can be multiple IOs in flight for different parts of the wall. And uh, we can now use, with decent performance, OD sync, which is basically a mode where the kernel can submit the IO. And uh, at once the IO is completed, we can be sure it's already been durably flushed to disk. There's no F sync or F data sync or something needed at the end. And with uh, modern storage, that uh, can be more efficient because uh, writes with OD sync can be implemented by like adding a bit to each IO saying, write through the cache. Uh, whereas like something like F data sync or F sync is implemented by just saying, write out all the dirty data in the drive cache. And obviously that can be a lot more expensive. Uh, we have vacuum, we have sequential scans, bitmap index scans, and uh, other similar um, things converted. So how, what have the results been so far? Uh, the fr my first conversion was checkpointing, and uh, it was also, I think, the most fun because before we could do maybe 1.5 gigabytes of check uh, checkpoint could write 1.5 gigabytes a second or something. Uh, now it's uh, I can was able to reach hardware limits of four drives in my workstation, and because I only have PCI3, that's somewhere on the order of 12 gigabytes a second. And it's very unlikely that we'll need a higher bandwidth for uh, checkpointing ever, because that's just so much data over. Like, it's hard to generate that much dirty data. Uh, we can do sequential scans a lot faster now. Uh, it's uh, because we don't need to do the memory copying from um, the kernel page cache. Instead, can use uh, DMA directly from the drive into shared buffers. That frees up a lot of CPU cycles uh, to process the I.O. And I'm seeing up to 2.5x faster sequential scans throughput uh, per core when there's cache passes, obviously. Uh, and one important part of that is that it also scales much better to larger number of, uh, to larger degree of parallelism for sequential scans. Uh, obviously, that only matters if the sequential scan uh, is can be processed somewhat fast because the conditions are uh, cheap enough to value it. If one has like a complicated uh, JSON predicate or something, uh, then the evaluation overhead will be so high that the overhead of the AO itself does not matter. We have concurrent copy. We have, uh, and that like lo data loading in parallel is much faster. And one thing that I didn't fully expect beforehand, we also have a, gotten a lot better uh, write heavy OTP performance. And that's mostly because we can write multiple parts of the wall in uh, concurrently. We can have multiple flushes of the wall happening in concurrently. Unfortunately, that requires that the buffers that need to be flushed are not the same because we, we, can, we only can write out whole pages of wall out at the same time, uh, which of have, has the odd, odd performance characteristics that initially the Throughput just is increases like it used to be pretty slowly because every time data is written out, uh, on, like the interval pages are only partially filled, and uh, only when the write volume concurrent write volume gets high enough, we have uh, independent pages that are f uh, independently full or um, that can be flushed. I've implemented uh, that we can pad such partially filled wall records. Uh, but that turns out to, and that's what other databases do, but the wall volume increase with that uh, at the moment is just tremendous in some bad case. I've seen like that use up three to four X uh, the wall volume, which is like a problem. We probably can improve some of that just by using better defaults in Postgres by, by default. 
each wall page is eight kilobyte, and we can easily reduce that for four kilobyte. Um, but that we might need some trickery to improve that further by, for example, doing some using the not padding it with zeros, but using like filling it with like data from background tasks or something, uh, so that we can use the rate quote unquote waste of space for something useful instead. Explain that a little bit more. So you basically saying, I got some pages and running up the Red Hat log, but I, I have an extra space. I'm going to piggyback random stuff. Yeah. For example, we could uh, uh, have vacuum uh, paste based, uh, like do be more aggressive when there's uh, padding space available and then not immediately uh, write that data into the wall, but fill it only when there's uh, padding space available. And there's some other, like Postgres uses uh, full page writes to write void issues around torn pages. And we could do some eager writing out of uh, pages in those situations. The Red Hat Log would see stuff that doesn't necessarily, like that aren't Red Hat, Red Hat Log records. Yeah, we could generate them basically whenever we have to flush uh, partially. Got it. Better data. Uh, okay. It, I wish I had a better approach, but so far that's <laughs> it. it. Okay. What, 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 why not like, like really fast, efficient compression? I guess that makes it worse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, like I had the weird cases where compression for compressing the wall by the throughput worse because of yeah. then it leads to that issue. All right. Question from Thunderstorm Dasana. Yeah, I was thinking about this issue. The writer could not wait for some determined amount of time before flushing the entire record to fill the record. Yeah, uh, I think we probably need some heuristics like that, like a certain delay, or uh, we only pad um, wall records if the concurrency is high enough, for example. Right. Like, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I've not quite implemented that yet, but I think that's probably some the minimum we have to do. Thank you. So, what's not working with AO and Postgres right now? Why haven't we merged this? There's a lot of uh, odd performance cases in like not necessarily in the most common use cases, but that are common enough to be problematic. Uh, it's actually, for example, hard to extend files in a way that. Uh, doesn't cause problems. Uh, Postgres uses uh, a design where each file, where each table has its own file or sets of files, rather than having one huge um, uh, file that then is like internally subdivided for uh, different relations, and that has uh, definite simplicity advantages. There's some advantages around like how quickly space can be released back to the operating system or the file system. But it also means that we, when we have to extend those files, we have to decide by how much to extend it. That's not a problem uh, when using buffered IO because uh, most file systems these days have something called delayed extension, where it only determines the actual file size uh, that's written out to disk when writing out data. And before that, it, doesn't, it just uses, buffers it in memory. But with direct IO, we have to allocate the size when we uh, extend or we, when we extend files, and it's not always easy to know how large a relation will be. We need a, if there's a new table and we just uh, start data uh, bulk loading it, we don't know yet whether it will be just a few kilobytes. In which case, uh, bulk extending it with with 128 megabytes will be a problem, or whether we it will be a a huge file, in which case bug extending it by 128 megabytes every time uh, is not a problem. And it turns out that uh, fragmentation, even in like uh, 128 kilobyte chunks, still isn't measurable performance wise, mostly because it increases the size of the metadata on, in the file system, so uh, which increases then access uh, overheads and uh, memory. Uh, the cache ratios. There's a lot of paths that aren't optimized for a direct arrow. That's not. That's just 
work. It's not there's nothing super hard about converting more places that aren't optimized for direct error, but it's definitely work. There's a lot of implementation weaknesses, particularly around when doing asynchronous write-back and backends and deciding when to do asynchronous write-back, how aggressively. But that's also something that can be addressed um, reasonably easily, I think. Uh, there's some weird slowdowns, and that is one of those cases where one just needs a lot of operating system-specific and potentially operating system version-specific tuning. For example, with IOU ring, when using buffered IO, it's uh, sometimes uh, IOU ring is slower when using buffered IO than just using a read, uh, because uh, IOU ring uh, always ends up doing the IO uh, in the reads as part of uh, the process context. Uh, whereas like when doing read ahead in the kernel, that uh, it's the work is uh, split across a bunch of kernel demons. And if I, there's enough I, uh, that one process has 100% CPU usage, and that's not actually that hard to reach, then uh, the multiple kernel threads win. So initially IOU is faster, except that when we hit a lot of, oh, Except when there's a lot of uh, uh, throughput, then suddenly IOU ring uh, has like this slight performance regression. And it, that's all solvable, uh, but it does show like how there's like a lot of weird operating systems and operating system version specific tuning. Uh, also, the weaknesses of our buffer replacement algorithm, including the ring buffers, really show when using direct error. Another kind of related issue is that there's a lot of cases where some other weaknesses in Postgres prevent fully benefiting from IO. For example, with when vacuuming a relation, now uh, IO uh, is not the bottleneck anymore, like the data for the data files or for the wall, but we access uh, need to determine like the transaction commit status fairly regularly when vacuuming. And that the buffering for that is so simplistic that if there's enough data, uh, we can end up being bottlenecked by copying the relevant data from the kernel all the time and spending 90% of the time just doing caching and discarding the cache for uh, commit statuses. And there's lots of other similar things. Uh, so what uh, are the next steps? Uh, there's a lot of polishing needed. Uh, as typically in a prototype, uh, it starts out pretty ugly, and this, it just needs to be uh, get cleaner and more better documented, and so on. Uh, and that's one of the big differences between, I guess, working on pro like academia prototypes and stuff that we want to ship to users. But uh, yeah, there's uh, we can also just start merging some prerequisites. There's enough of that that we can do. Uh, big bigger questions are stuff like. What uh, do we need to do on like an algorithmic basis? We currently have a very simplistic algorithm for how aggressively to prefetch, but because the harder characteristics are so like differ so much, we really need like some something adaptive. And we're working with a simulator to uh, evaluate uh, prefetching algorithms uh, in like a lot shorter time than using real hardware uh, to improve that and. I really hope uh, that that we can get some to something ha mostly adaptive uh, without needing lots of tuning. There's lots of planner and executor that improvements that we need to be able to do AO because right now for a normal index scans, for example, we don't know which other patches, uh, pages we could read ahead because the way the executor and the plan uh, is structured. And then that might also require some planner improvements. We do to need to switch to a different better uh, buffer replacement algorithms, fairly obviously why. Yeah. Um, we currently only do accurate prefetching. That is, we know that the data will be needed soon. We don't, it might be worth doing some heuristic prefetching. I've been doing some experimental results by just prefetching neighboring pa pa pages. Uh, when doing, for example, index scans, like fetching the heap data or a table data, that seems to work reasonably well. But uh, obviously, that was uh, just experimental, and I'm sure there's lots of downsides. Yeah. Uh, 
those are the biggest issues. With that, I think I'm done. Okay, so I will clap on behalf of everyone attending here. Um, so we have about five minutes or so for questions. Um, so open up to the audience, uh, fire, fire away. Unmute yourself, you want to go for it. Okay, then I will ask questions. Um, <clears throat> so th there's a lot here, okay. So the, the basic proposal is that now there will be a, a separate worker that just handles IO, like an IO scheduler, right? I mean, that will only be used as a fallback. Normally, you want will we use IO Euring or IOCP or whatever the yeah. IO API is in the process to do that IO themselves. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, so the fallback would be like if you're running on uh, Solaris, right? That doesn't have a then like it, it basically acts as a broker as if it was, you know, yeah. The, the, yeah, okay, okay. Um, or if the kernel is too old to have IOU ring or something like that. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, and then the, and then so, so it's still, so like the, you know, when I think of the technical data Postgres, uh, my students and I were talking about this, it's the OS page cache, the process model, and then the append only MVCC, um, so the only thing really you have to change here with this new approach is, is just the, getting rid of the OS page cache. Again, in, in the cases where you can, right? All the yeah. other the other parts of the process stay the same. Um, yeah, there's some other like minor, there's some architectural work that was needed, but like it's it doesn't address any of those big ticket items that you mentioned. And I think that was one of the design goals was to be able to do work on just quote unquote, just one because it's already multiple years of work. And if you just want to fix all of them at once, we'll never get anywhere. Okay. Um, and then when you talk about replacing the buffer replacement algorithm, like, so would this be keeping the ring buffer and, and then, or like using ARC, I don't know if the IBM patent is gone yet, like like something that can handle sequential scan flooding uh, all within a single unified uh, sort of you know, space of memory. I don't think we would necessarily need the ring buffers for read IO. We probably would want them still for write IO to limit the amount of uh, dirtying that one process is allowed to do uh, just for latency and impact per like reduction purposes. Um, I do think we would want to switch to another uh, algorithm. I don't think ARC, there's some issues in ARC with uh, how to allow for sufficient concurrency, if I remember this correctly. It's, it's a, like it's surprisingly hard to have a um, like a lot of the theoretical literature and cache algorithms or buffer replacement algorithms uh, skips over a lot of the uh, real world concurrency issues associated with them. There, the, and there is a solution to that um, in the form of CAR, which is its yeah. successor. Yeah, it, but there's also some issues in CAR, though. Uh, I it's been a while since I looked at it, but yeah, I definitely think we need. The car is probably closer to what we want than uh, just ARC. Car, car being the clock variant, if you will, of the original ARC. But there's, yeah, there's, uh, uh, there's some other paper that I can't remember the name of, uh, but yeah. Are you talking about the, the one that they use in, in ODB? Um, I... Don't know right now. We'll have to look okay. at our it's I'm not good with remembering acronyms, unfortunately. Yeah, I think it begins with I. Um, I actually had a kind of a question, but it's uh, it's going to be one of it's kind of it's kind of vague and high level. So you know, bear with me. Uh, why is it that um, so so you said something about heuristics and um, heuristic prefetching, meaning prefetching based on speculative criteria. I think that's kind of what you mm -hmm. meant, right? Um, I wonder, how does one think about that? Um, there must be some kind of general sense of a break-even point. Um, I thought about doing more of that stuff for, for my own work on, on indexing. Um, you know, you sort of have more bandwidth than you know what to do with, potentially. Um, is there some kind of um, 
high level cost model that can inform intuitions? I mean, or is it sort of just try and see? I think for now, I think it's fine to not have any heuristic prefetching from what I've seen. I think uh, we can get better results, but I would not touch it for the initial merged version. Uh, I, I have no good feeling, good intuition about how to, what kind of heuristics to use and what how to limit the worst cases and so on. I'm sure that there's, we can probably get some in, information from what the current latency is and and how much IOs we are allowed to have in flight and do more aggressive prefetching based on the number of IOs in flight or something like that, but I don't know. Pete has a question. Can I ask my question now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. So uh, have you looked at using uh, Intel Optane in the byte mode? So basically the trade-off over here is that you get more of it, uh, but it's like it's lower. Uh, I've looked at it. I don't think it is hugely interesting for now, just because it is such a different model from how most other storage is accessed and the gains aren't all that huge and it's not widely available. So designing for it uh, is probably not quite the right trade-off. Um, it would be fairly easy to have like a different uh, backend or uh, something uh, like uh, AO backend that redirects everything to or that benefits from uh, pers like personal memory in s by avoiding all the that overhead, uh, but the normal IO overhead. But I'm not entirely sure. There's also some. Like we can't just use uh, persistent memory or something to back uh, like our share buffers directly because of like ordering requirements uh, and so on. But yeah, I, in the end, it's I think just too niche to be care too much about at this point. Just for my bill. Yeah. All right. My last question would be. This is basically another way to also think about this too. Is like now that you have this, you know, this check when the system boots up. What you know, what you know, do I support AIO? Do I support IOU ring? Uh, if not, then they have a fallback mechanism. But now because you have this API that would allow, in the fallback mechanism case, the Postgres regular worker to communicate with the IO worker, the IO scheduler. In theory now, do you think this will be easier for people to, you know, for everyone who's always, you know, forking Postgres and making your databases, now that they could just replace that backend storage part, that's sort of the, 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 the fallback option and replace that sort of process with whatever, you know, whether it's Optane or whatever the device, you know, S3, whatever device they want it now too, and still get all the benefit of Postgres up above that stays the same. They just replace that one prop, that, that, that schedule worker then now they can support new IO without having to rewrite everything or even use a foreign data wrapper. Is that a fair way to think about this? I suspect there's quite a few limitations around what information you have available to make this work, uh, to just do huge pragmatic uh, paradigm changes as part of just that layer, because at the IO layer, you might not have enough information to decide about uh, things. Um, I suspect in a lot of cases you can you uh, it would be more useful to change things on um, like create a new table access method or uh, switch things out in the there's a storage manager API which is currently not very often replaced but you can change where like how things are mapped to files there and that might actually be the better uh, place. Uh, to change things, change things for this purpose. I, I didn't realize it was a storage manager API. So yeah, if that, I mean, if that's the case. The runtime extensible. So it's okay. just compile time extensible. So it, and there's some limitations around that too. So yeah, but okay. it might make, right. make, so, make more sense for this. So just thought, do you have a, one, one quick question? Yeah, I, I just had one question about this uh, um, 
statement that you said you could generate 12 gigabytes per second checkpoint in traffic i was mm-hmm. curious how were you able to do that were you having a tool of your own or was it a real work workload from for some database uh i think i was uh using like bulk loading data and it disabled the logic that or no i used a bulk loaded data in a way that the ring buffers don't take effect that limit the amount of dirty data and then i just uh, shut down the database and saw what memory uh, what io bandwidth i was reaching i see uh, and so you didn't have wall logging enabled oh just it was with wall logging okay. i mean but like I... for the checkpointing itself checkpoint, of course yeah. sure. doesn't yeah. do a lot of again it writes a tiny bit of wall but like it's not typically limited by uh checkpoint uh, like by wall performance uh the data loading like generating the dirty data takes a lot longer than uh like def- that part definitely doesn't happen with 12 gigabytes a second so i think the point is mainly that after when using ao in a good way and as part of checkpointing then the checkpointing is not a bottleneck anymore because you can't generate dirty data quick enough most of the time right okay thank you Okay. I thought um, you made you made lots of other improvements that actually improved the other side too. That's great. Thank you. 